Hello everybody and welcome back to another GeekerWatt video. Today, you join me from my brand new studio space for an incredible $1,500 gaming PC build. Not only have I got loads more space, I mean, look how big this desk is, but also, oh hey there. I've got an overhead camera angle now, which is so cool. I hope it doesn't fall on my head, but let's get into the build. Now, as with all of my builds, we're gonna kick it off with the CPU, motherboard, and the RAM. Now, for the motherboard that you can see, look at that on the overhead camera angle, um, I've got the MSI MPG X570 Gaming Edge. That's a lot of words. I opted for X570 in today's build because there was the budget for it, we've got a bit more overclocking headroom, and it's also got like this little snazzy fan uh, to cool our chipset down, which is quite, which is quite interesting. Now in the motherboard, we're gonna be installing our CPU. And for the CPU, I opted for the AMD Ryzen 5 3600X. With a base clock speed of 3.8 gigahertz, boosting all the way up to 4.4. Now that's pretty quick. With six cores and 12 threads, it covers all the necessary bases very well indeed. The final thing we're gonna install onto our motherboard uh, is our RAM. Now for this, I went for the Adata Spectrix D60G. I've used this memory quite a lot really and never had any problems with it. The one reason I like it though is because it's like the most RGB'd up memory you can buy which is mental. Basically, all this here, RGB. That, yes, gets me excited. To install the memory, all you've got to do is pull back the retention clips, uh, in this case, on DIMMs one and three, because it technically starts at zero, and line up the notch on the RAM with the notch on your motherboard. And just like that, the RAM, CPU, and motherboard are all nicely dealt with. We're then gonna pop this to one side, and I can now do that because I have a massive table. Can you tell I'm excited about this space? It's, ah. Oh. Talking of things that are cool, we're now gonna grab our case from Cooler Master. I think that's the first pun in the new office. I really like this case, it's their TD500 mesh. It's got a mesh panel up front, as well as addressable RGB fans, which look sick. All around, great price point, smashing case. What I would recommend you do with any case uh, in any build is take off, that was close, <laughs> is take off as many panels as you can first. This is gonna make your life a little bit easier later on down the line. Now, apologies if the case is a bit dark. I'm still trying to figure out uh, the lighting situation in the new office which is more complicated than you would probably think. <laughs> Once it's all laid flat, we're then gonna take our motherboard. Um, now this one comes with a built-in IO shield, which means all you have to do is slide it straight into the case. And there you have it. I'm starting to like the look of this already. The next component on today's hit list is our CPU cooler. This is the Cooler Master ML at 240R. It's got addressable RGB fans, like our case, it's got a black radiator, fits with the color scheme, and it's pretty affordable as well at $90 to $100. Though for up-to-date price and links for everything, I'll put Amazon links in the description below, and that kind of thing. Now, because I'm awkward, I want to mount the radiator at the front of the case. That will then leave our two included fans free to go at the top and make this thing look completely RGB'd up. So first we need to take some of these fan screws out and replace them with the long included radiator screws. With the radiator screwed in and that front panel just about back on, I need to pop some thermal paste uh, onto our CPU. You do get a tube included uh, with the CPU cooler. Try not to overdo it. A grain of rice, as every single person on YouTube says, but it's about right. And then fasten down uh, the CPU water block pump cooler head, whatever you want to call it. Oh dear. Now, 
Next up is the SSD, and this one is a bit of a special one. This here is a one terabyte SSD. It's pretty affordably priced, and it's RGB. All you have to do is plug in this extra little micro USB to addressable RGB connector, which is the same as the fans in, in the whole of this system, and it's gonna sync up and look great. And this here, and this here, <laughs> this here is from Team Group, and it's called their SSD Gaming Delta. What a name. The penultimate component of today's build, but probably the most exciting, let's be honest, is our graphics card. Uh, now this here is the RTX 2070 Super from MSI. I'll take a deep dive into the performance of this card in the benchmark section in a moment. All you need to know for now though is that that beefy three fan cooler with RGB looks sick. Installing the graphics card super easy, pop back the clip on the PCIe slot and then unscrew the two PCIe covers. If we spin the case around to look at the cables today, that segues us very nicely into the final component of today's build, our power supply. I went for the Cooler Master MWE 650 Gold. It's a fully modular power supply, it's 80 plus gold certified, meaning it's super efficient and gives us some headroom for future upgradability, and you only plug in the cables that you need, which helps to avoid that unnecessary cable mess and cable clutter. So then, let's install the power supply, do some cable management, and then jump into some games to see how this system performs. Roll the time lapse. Now it's time to answer that all important question over how well or not well this system performs. I installed a load of the most popular games onto this machine from the newest RTX enabled titles to older games like GTA 5 and CSGO to try and get a real balance. Starting off with Call of Duty's Warzone, the incredibly fun and completely free Battle Royale with RTX enabled 1440p high settings was seen in the region of 100 frames per second. That means that you could possibly jump up to 4K, knock a couple of settings down and keep above the 60fps mark consistently if you chose to do so. Moving on to Project Cars 2, a much, much easier game to run by comparison, and at 4K high settings, we're seeing in the region of 130 to 150 FPS on average. It's a really great gaming experience actually at 4K, and what it indicates is that for those of you that have got, say, three 1080 or 1440p monitors and want to do an immersive surround kind of cockpit setup, this machine has definitely got the headroom to do so. Next up on my list was O. Overwatch, my favourite game actually at the minute, I just can't get enough of it. 4K ultra settings and we're pinned at that 70 FPS mark. Overwatch really likes to stick to a frame rate, kind of like V-Sync but not V-Sync, uh, less intensive but rather than having kind of 100 FPS one minute and then having 42, it likes to have a constant 70 and it impressed, it looks fantastic, that ultra settings never lets you down, fair play to Overwatch. I'm speaking as though Overwatch is a person. It isn't, I'm just in love with the game. I've also got to give a massive shout out to MSI for hooking it up with this 4K curved monitor. It made benchmarking the games today a dream. And the curved panel is actually really, really immersive. They also hooked it up with like this low profile mechanical keyboard, one of their new releases. And honestly, I've fallen in love with it. I'm probably gonna put this in my big setup video that's coming very, very soon. Moving on to Battlefield 5, one of the, of course, kind of headline ray tracing titles, 1440p, high settings, we're seeing 70 to 75 frames per second. I appreciate the frame rate counter here is really crap, um, that's EA and Origin's fault, uh, but you'll be glad to hear the game performs and looks very good indeed. 
Next up is another one of my favourite titles, Forza Horizon 4. I went for a nice drive this time rather than just whacking the benchmark mode on. And at 4K ultra settings, we see an 80 to 95 frames per second on average. Forza Horizon 4 looks incredible. And I've said it before, I'll say it again. It's one of the games in the racing genre that would actually benefit if it supported ray tracing. It's already super duper immersive. So Microsoft, get on that, get it sorted out. Next up is CSGO, as I alluded to earlier, 4K high settings, and we're looking 24 fr I'm joking, of course we're not. We're looking around about 190 FPS, sometimes over 200, um, and that was offline with bots. And what that means is that when you actually play yourself online, the frame rate might be slightly higher because the computer hasn't got a mess about kind of deciding what the bots do and don't do. Either way though, I don't think I can be criticized for that because 190 plus frames per second is good enough however you picture it. Uh, the penultimate game on today's list is GTA 5, one of the most popular games ever. I've put so many hundreds of hours into this game, it is obscene. 4K high settings, we're looking 55 to 70 FPS. I would advise putting it on high and not very high and tuning down some of the kind of render distance and scaling settings to half. That way you can still get a really immersive 4K experience, but stick consistently around the 60 frames per second mark. The final game on my list today is Apex Legends. Here we're seeing 1440p high, 90 to 150 ish frames per second. I don't know why I didn't run it at 4K. 4K would have given you some equally great results. It would have been 70 plus FPS if I had to have a good guess. Uh, I did run the ray tracing titles at 1440p because I think that's a fairer way to do things. And I think the resolution trade-off in exchange for the real immersive improvement in Battlefield 5 and COD Warzone is definitely worth the the kind of sacrifice, if you will, of pixels. With that being said though, I think that just about wraps it up for today's video. If you did enjoy it, give it a big old like rating and make sure to get subscribed. Thank you very much for watching and as always, you guessed it, we'll see you in the next Geekawatt video. Or at least I hope we will. Please tune in next time.